هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> We continue with our explanation of the Qur'an and we continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Quraysh this week bin Allah Ta'ala. In terms of the Quraysh, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has preferred this tribe of Quraysh over the many many tribes across the world. And particularly in terms of the Quraysh, you'll find two main virtues. Particularly with this surah, um, Imam Al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah, he mentions a narration from the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has preferred the Quraysh with seven things. He has preferred the Quraysh with seven things. And the Messenger of Allah SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to mention that I am from Quraysh, that Nabuwa is inside of Quraysh, that Quraysh has a surah revealed about them, that the Quraysh were in charge of feeding the Hujjaj and granting them um, their drink. And he mentions two other things as well. Likewise, the Messenger of Allah SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, in another narration talking about the Quraysh, the Messenger of Allah SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala chose from the Arabs Kinana, and from Kinana He chose the Quraysh, from the Quraysh He chose Banu Hashim, and from Banu Hashim He chose me. So here is another virtue of the Quraysh that Allah's Messenger SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they were selected specifically by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala from amongst the various tribes. Now when you get into the surah, when you get into the surah itself, it starts off by saying, and this is one of the interesting facts that, I don't know if you remember, but when we started off this tafsir halaqa, we mentioned that the individual who relies purely on translation, he becomes captive of the translator. Meaning that you will be purely dependent on the one that is translating the Qur'an. So if you look at this very first word, verse in uh, Surah Al-Quraysh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِإِلَى fi Quraysh. You'll notice that in the translation that you have, and if you look at the various translations, every single translator will translate this verse differently. Every single translator will translate this verse differently. I went through six different translations, and all six of them had six different translations of this very first verse. And the different translations are purely dependent on how the translator understood the word ilaf. How did the translator understand the word ilaf? So the general meaning of ilaf over here comes down to one of three meanings. It comes down to one of three meanings. So the first meaning of ilaf that is possible over here is that of a gathering, is that of a gathering. So when a person, when, a, when a, a people gather, then this is a, a type of ilaf. And you'll notice that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in uh, various parts of the Quran. When he talks about that uniting of the hearts and uniting of the people, this term ilaf is used. The second meaning of ilaf over here that is possible is that of being granted security. That of being granted security. So when the people are granted security, this is like a contentment in the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants. And that is another meaning of ilaf over here. And then the third meaning of ilaf, what is possible as well, is that of a custom or of that of a ritual. Of that of a ritual. Now that you understand what the term ilaf means, it has these three possible meanings in this context. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the ilaf of the Quraysh. The ilaf of the Quraysh. Sorry, the, the third meaning I gave you in terms of custom, it's a customary protection. So at certain times, they will be granted a protection. So it's not just a custom, but it's a customary protection. That at certain times, at certain rituals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them protection. So now that you understand the meanings of ilaf, let us look at what the ilaf is actually referring to over here. So firstly, looking at this lam over here, looking at this lam over here, the scholars differed, why is this lam over here to begin with? Because this lam, it makes the word after it have a kasra. Now generally speaking, in order to do so, it can have possible connotations. So you look at why is the lam over here, and again we come down to three opinions. We come down to three opinions. Number one, the first opinion, is that Surah Al-Quraysh is in fact a continuation from the surah before it. 
And who can tell me what the surah before it is? Which is Surah Al-Fil. Excellent. So they said it is a continuation of Surah Al-Fil, dealing again with the city of Mecca and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Mecca and the Quraysh in particular at that time. So they said that this lamb is to indicate that it is a continuation from the surah before it. Why did they make this claim? So the reason they made this claim was that if you were to look at the Mus'haf of Ubay ibn Kaab, Ubay ibn Kaab being one of the companions who wrote down the Quran, Ubay ibn Kaab in his Mus'haf, Surah Al-Fil and Surah Al-Quraysh were in fact one surah. There was no separation between Surah Al-Fil and Surah Al-Quraysh. Whereas if you look at the finalized version of Uthman radiallahu anhu, before all of the other copies of the Quran were destroyed, in the finalized version of Uthman radiallahu anhu, they were in fact two different surahs. And after that, consensus actually took place. There is a jma' amongst the Sahaba that Surah Al-Fil and Surah Al-Quraysh were in fact two different surahs. And that is why this opinion in particular, you'll see that the scholars did not hold it in, you know, much, did not give it much weight. They didn't say that it was like a popular uh, or accepted opinion. The second opinion, and this is one of the opinions attributed to Abdullah ibn Abbas, is that this lamb over here, again, is to show a connection with another verse inside of this surah. Another verse inside of this surah. And that is the verse number three, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ So the translation, the way it would be affected then, would be that look at the way the Quraysh gathered, and this gathering that is being referred to over here, is the gathering for the journeys they used to take to Yemen, and to Syria, uh, to Asham in the winter and summer times. So look at the way they used to gather during those times. That they would go in flocks and in caravans to these lands to do business. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indirectly telling them that let them, let them gather in the exact same way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. That if you can gather together for the sake of the dunya, for the sake of doing this business, then let them gather as well for the sake of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was an opinion attributed to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. Then the third opinion over here is that the lamb is what they call for ta'ajjub, for amazement. For meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the people that this is something so simple, yet it is something to be profound of, something to be amazed by. And the gathering of the Quraysh was something to be amazed by. That without fail, every single year, no matter what would happen, the Quraysh would gather to go and travel either to uh, Yemen in the winter time or to Asham in the summer time. So this is something to be amazed by. Now why is this something to be amazed by? Can anyone possibly think why? Why is this something that would be amazing to the Quraysh, that would make them stick out? This requires a bit of historical perspective of that region at that time. What was the Arabian desert like at that time? You just mentioned that they, they had the rights to do the uh, distribute the water in the Hajj time. So they are special in the case of uh, 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 people. Okay, so indirectly, you're correct. So that's the, the, the second point I was going to make. Where number two is, that wherever the Quraysh went, they had like a preferred status. You know, in our day and age, if you find out that someone's like born and raised and lives in Medina, you're like, mashallah, you know, this is such a, a noble status to have. Similarly, at that time, and even until this time today, if you were from the Quraysh, you were from the caretakers of the Kaaba. You were the ones that took care of the pilgrims, the people that came to make Hajj. And people used to give them special attention. So that was the second thing, that the Quraysh, the only reason they were preferred amongst the people was because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted that preference to them first. But there's a second and more simpler reason. That why was that an amazing journey for them? I'll give you a hint, that if you think about a woman traveling without a mahram, there's a hadith talking about a woman traveling without a mahram, that is a clue to why this trip was amazing. Very okay, difficult and dangerous. Okay, well, explain. Uh, you could, uh, yeah, any difficulty, any... Did you pick that up from my hint or did you just... No, uh, hint, I mean... Okay, so explain the hint. What is the hadith I was referring to? It's about uh, a wolf. Uh, it refers to animals attacking you. Ahsant, ahsant. So in the hadith, was that what you were going to mention as well, Ayub? No. Go ahead, let me hear what you were going to say. Oh, I was just thinking, since the travel is so predictable, it would be easy to ambush them all. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point, that's a good point. Okay, that's good. We can mention that as well. So the first point and the most important point is that the Quraysh were granted safety. 
that you know they would travel these far distances no one would rob them they would not get attacked by animals there was no sandstorms none of these things were actually reported during those journeys so the hint that i was trying actually trying to give is that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam talks about safety at the end of time that a woman will travel from the sacred lands to hadramaut not fearing anyone except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Meaning that, generally speaking, that journey from the sacred lands to Yemen was a very dangerous journey. That you could get attacked by animals, you could get robbed. But this woman would travel by herself and she would have no one to fear except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was something amazing. That outside of these times, if anyone was to travel, then they would get attacked by animals, by storms. They would be robbed. As Ayub was mentioning that this was something that took place twice a year. It is very predictable. You want to rob a whole caravan of people, you know, this is your ideal opportunity. You know when they're going to do it. You know approximately how many they are and you'll know what they have. So they all could have went down, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. A second point pertaining to the ilaf over here, this gathering. Uh, we mentioned that opinion number one is that the lamb was referring to, that is a continuation from Surah Al-Fil. There's also an opinion that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the ilaf, the gathering, this ilaf is referring to the ilaf that took place during the attack of Surah Al-Fil, where the Quraysh got together and they were, you know, on the verge of protecting their lands before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala sent their, those birds, and that's something we'll talk about next week, within Lahi Taala. So the ilaf could also potentially be referring to the protection or the the gathering of the Quraysh that they had during the attack of Abraha and the attackers of the Kaaba during that time. Now, when you look at it. Allah knows best, but it seems that the, ila, the lamb over here is referring to the lamb of ta'ajjub. The lamb over here is referring to the lamb of ta'ajjub. That is an act of amazement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing attention to. As for the ilaf over here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a gathering, it seems that the gathering that seems to be strongest is the gathering that is actually referring to in Surah Al-Quraysh. Is the gathering that is actually being referred to in Surah Al-Quraysh. And we'll speak about it why. We'll mention it why. So in the very next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, إِلَافِهِمْ رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ That they're gathering for the journey of the winter and the summer. The winter and the summer. Now who can remind me of a principle when we're, that deals with repetition in the Qur'an? We've, throughout our journey in this tafsir class, we've been talking about a principle in tafsir that deals with repetition and how we should deal with repetition. Go ahead. Establishing a new meaning, we'll say in English. Establishing a new meaning is better than uh, a repetition. Uh, well, repeating the same meaning again. Emphasis is better than emphasis. Yes. So the principle states at ta'sisu awla min at ta'kid that establishing a new meaning for the Quran is more eloquent than repeating and emphasizing the same point over. So when Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions ilaf. A group of scholars, and it almost seems like the majority, they said that the ilaf is repeated over here for the sake of emphasis. That the ilaf is referring to the journey of the winter and the summer. But if, according to the principles of tafsir, we want to try to establish different meanings. So if you, would, if you take this principle and apply it over here, it seems that the ilaf over here is the gathering of al-fil, when they gather together to protect the Kaaba, that is what it is referring to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then we move on to the second verse. إِلَافِهِمْ رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ So their gathering or their protection in this journey during the winter and the summer time. During the journey and the winter time. Now I want to do a small exercise over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He speaks through the Qur'an, every single word is said with wisdom behind it. There is a wisdom behind each and every single word that is said. And as a person who reads the Qur'an, you want to try to ponder and deliberate what is the wisdom behind each word. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ That He mentions the journey of the winter before the journey of the summer. What are possible wisdoms that we can derive that why the winter would be mentioned before the summer? When generally speaking, if you look at the seasons of the month, the summer comes before the winter. So what is a possible wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would mention the journey of the winter before the journey of the summer? This is going to require a bit of thinking. No? Go ahead, mention it. There's no fear in these things. It's a learning experience. Go ahead. Maybe the winter journey was one for to turn greater. Why? <laughs> You're just guessing. <laughs> but it's a good guess. Go ahead. 
No other things, and uh, because desert has a storm, right? If it is very hot, the storm will be disaster, right? Mm -hmm. So this can be Allah Subhanahu wa said, the winter is better than summer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prefers the winter over the summer. I don't know how you came to that conclusion, but that is an opinion. Honestly, that is an opinion. I don't know how you got there, but that is an opinion. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer prefers the winter months, prefers the winter months. And this is why you find a narration from al Hassan al-Basri. Some of them attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, but Allah knows best. It seems it is a narration from al Hassan al-Basri. He said, how amazing is the winter time for the believer. That the days are short so that they can fast, and the nights are long so that they can pray. So this is an indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave preference to the winter times over the summer times, where there is more difficulty involved. So that was one of the opinions that is mentioned. What was your opinion again? Why did you say it was better? Uh, that was, you know, more beneficial. There was more benefit in it. Honestly, I don't remember coming across such an opinion. I don't remember coming across such an opinion. The reason why I mention this is because obviously this is a very simple point that anyone who's reading this verse, they will clear that the summer is meant to come before the winter. In, in any language you study, there's no language that says, you know, winter comes before summer. Everyone has, generally speaking, the same order. Now what's interesting to look at is what uh, was attributed to Al-Hafidh ibn Kathir. I couldn't find this in Ibn Kathir, but it is attributed to him. That in fact when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Arabian desert, there were only two seasons there. There was no spring and autumn. They just had winter and summer. So there was no transition and that is why um, you know, it only comes down to two. It only comes down to two. Now with that having been said, think about it this way. What is summertime? It is the presence of what? Heat. It is the presence of heat. Now when that heat is taken away, you get winter, correct? So they said that the asal, the foundation in weather is the absence of heat, which is the winter time. And that is the, the origin in weather that it will be cold until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with sun and then it becomes hot. So the asal would be the, the, the cold until the heat is brought and then the sun comes in. And this shows you again the subtlety of, of the Qur'an subhanAllah. Such simple concepts, yet very very few people will take time to ponder that. Even if you look inside the books of tafsir, you don't even find too many mufassirin discussing this point that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this shita before the saif. And it seems that the asal is cold until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the people with heat and then you know the, the summertime comes about. Another point about this verse, yeah. I'm just going to say about this point, uh, that is, isn't uh, Allah, uh, uh, you're saying it might be from Hafid bin Kathir, wasn't, isn't there a hadith saying that, uh, that the desert used to be green, uh, and the day of judgment will not be established until... The, the desert becomes green. They go back to being like that? Yes. Or were they created, uh, doesn't have dispute the fact they might not have been created as deserts? Allahu Alam, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Research it and let me know inshallah. Taib. Another point, when you study the books of tafsir, there's a, a minority opinion. In fact, this was attributed to Abdullah ibn Abbas, but the isnad of it actually has a weakness, even though some of the scholars mention it anyways. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ilafim rahlat al-shita'i wa sayf. Ilafim again meaning gathering over here. The gathering meaning that the rahlat al-shita' was in... Um, is it was in, uh, in Mecca during the summertime and in a ta'if during the winter time. So Mecca during the summertime and a ta'if during the winter time. This was attributed to Abdullah ibn Abbas. You should know just across, just in case you come across this opinion, but it was a very weak opinion and even the isnad to Abdullah ibn Abbas, it seems very, very weak. We move on to the third verse. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ So let them worship the Lord of this house. Let them worship the Lord of this house. The fa at the beginning of this verse. We saw this fa very recently, two surahs ago. This fa, we saw it very very recently, two surahs ago. Who can remind me what this fa is for? What is this fa an indication for? Allah uh, connects it to, I wasn't there for the Prophet, but it should connect it to something that came before probably about that they're given the privilege of having these easy journeys and these gatherings. So give thanks and worship Allah. Excellent, excellent. So in Surah Al-Kawthar, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna atayna kal kawthar fasalli li rabbika wa nar. So the fa over here is an indication that this is an action that you should now take. That Allah gave you these great blessings, so follow up those great blessings by action, which is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this fa that is mentioned over here is the exact same fa that was mentioned in Surah Al Kawthar. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as compensation for these great blessings that Allah has given you in terms of the safety and in terms of the journey and successful business and protection and all of these things, then let them now worship the Lord of this house. Let them now worship the Lord of this house. And you'll notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here, He doesn't mention, so let them worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not mention, let them worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But He says, let them worship the Lord of this house. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Kaaba as a clear sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you talk about you know, signs of the existence of God, the existence of Allah, one of the clearest signs is the Kaaba itself. Is the Kaaba itself. And for so many reasons. Number one is that anyone who has seen the Kaaba for the very first time can, you know, can re- remember that feeling that overcame them the very first time. That the first time you see the Kaaba, it is almost impossible that you will see the Kaaba and you will not break down in tears. It is almost impossible. Till this day, when you go for Hajj, when you go for Umrah, you can tell who are the people who have been here for the first time just by the tears that are coming down their eyes. That they get overcome by this emotion that they can't hold back. It is just a feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives inside a person where they break down and they start making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a clear sign. Another clear sign is that 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, some type of ibadah is taking place over there. Some type of ibadah is taking place over there. So either people are making tawaf or salah is going on. There's not a time where either tawaf or salah is not going on. In fact, if you read the story of Johiman, do you guys know the story of Johiman? Johiman, his story was that him and his crew, they took the Kaaba as hostage. They took the Kaaba as hostage. This is in 1979. They take the Kaaba as hostage and you know, guns start blazing and people are being shot and a whole bunch of stuff is happening. You can read the historical perspective of it. But if you read the live accounts of, uh, of this story, they mention that even at that time, even though there were no people making tawaf, you would still see the birds making tawaf around the house. You would still see the birds making tawaf around the house. Meaning that subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, to continue the worship being taking place at that time, He sent the birds to make tawaf around the Kaaba at that time. Now you may think this is exaggerated, but if you look at the historical you know, recordings of this event, this is what quite a few of the recordings mention, that the birds were sent to make tawaf around the Kaaba. So the sign, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Kaaba as a sign to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A second reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتَ Let them worship the Lord of this house, is that this is amongst them. This is a reminder for them all the time. That they would go to the Kaaba for their gatherings, they would go to the Kaaba for their rituals, they would see the Kaaba during the Hajj time. So this is a reminder for them that this Kaaba is there, and let them worship the Lord that created this great blessing amongst them. That the ability that they had to take care of the Hujjaj, the ability that they had to be preferred over the people, it was because of this very Kaaba. So let them worship the Lord that created this Kaaba, and placed this Kaaba over there. A third interesting thing to mention over here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He mentions that let them worship Rabbah uh, al-Bayt, let them worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question arises, did the Quraysh worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? What's the answer to that question? Did the Quraysh worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their ultimate object of worship? Go ahead. Yeah. Explain. Uh, so in terms of distress, they're called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent, so that's point number one. In times of ease, oh. they would uh, try to go to intermediaries to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. Their ultimate goal was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you give me a verse from the Quran to supplement what you're saying? Or substantiate okay. what you're saying? Uh, so, I'll start you off. مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ ذُلْفَى أحسنت So they say over here, we don't worship them, except for so that they will increase us in nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Ahsant. Jazakallahu khair. So the third point we mentioned over here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not accepted. So if you look at the way the Quraysh used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it wasn't a direct worship. It was not a direct worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather they would always bring intermediaries. They would always bring intermediaries. So this verse over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ That we do not worship these people, except that they will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another verse, هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا إِنْدَ اللَّهِ That these intermediaries, they are the ones that will intercede on our behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was their ultimate goal and their ultimate desire, the fact that they brought intermediaries in between showed that their ibadah was not accepted. It showed that their ibadah was not accepted. And the second point that Ayyub mentioned was that the Quraysh, in times of distress, they would eliminate their intermediaries. They would go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly and worship Him directly in terms of making dua. So the fact that sometimes they went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly and sometimes they didn't still shows the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not accept their ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not accept their ibadah. And then the last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ That He is the one who has fed them against hunger and has made them safe from fear. He is the one who has fed them against hunger and has made them safe against fear. The first thing to notice is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these two things in particular because they are the two most important things that every country needs. That the country will need its members to survive, its citizens to survive through food. And that is the physical survival. And then you have the concept of emotional survival. That you can't constantly be living in a state of fear. So if you've been granted these two things, it is as if you're the most successful and you know, you have the most in this dunya. And this is in fact an approximate wording of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that whoever wakes up and has had, you know, been sufficed in his food and his body is without any illness, then it is as if he has been blessed with all of the blessings of this dunya. Meaning that there's no one that is more successful than him. Because every individual is desiring this, that they be in a good state of health and they be emotionally well. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these two particular things because these are the two most important things that all the citizens are seeking. That they want to have food in their stomachs and they want to be safe. They don't want to live in times of fear. They don't want to live in times of war. And subhanAllah, this is a, like a reflection for us. A real reflection for us. That subhanAllah, here living in, in Canada, particularly Calgary, I mean, when was the last time we felt any hunger? That we, it, it's so bad that we have to impose hunger on ourselves. You know, imagine if we did not have Ramadan, when would we ever feel hunger? We wouldn't, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with so much. And for those of us who have been born and raised here in Calgary and had lived in Canada, you know, when was the last time we actually felt any fear? You know, when was the last time you, you heard a siren saying that a bomb is now going to drop? When was the last time you thought that someone would break into your house and rob you? When was the last time you thought that someone would come in and kill your father or rape your mother or take away your children? I mean, these are great blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they're rampant in the other part of the world. But here, living in North America, living in Calgary, this is a big, big blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that, you know, you get so used to because one, you haven't experienced it, you know, being in that state. And two, it, you don't see it amongst the people. So you become heedless of this. But this is something that, you know, when you count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is something that you make shukr for. That the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us safety in our lands is, is a big, big you know, blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice that, you know, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this documentary, uh, Bowling for Columbine. Has anyone seen that documentary? Bowling for Columbine? No one? Has anyone heard of that documentary? We have one person. Anyone else heard of this documentary? Bowling for Columbine? Michael Moore, exactly. I'm surprised no one's heard of this. So anyways, this documentary is based upon a shooting that took place in the United States. So what Michael Moore did was that he compared the United States, Detroit and Windsor. And you know, these are like almost two twin cities. In fact, Windsor is the only city that is south of the United States. So meaning that Detroit is actually higher than Windsor. And you know, they're right next to each other. Literally, there's a bridge that connects the two cities. You go to a place like Detroit, and honestly, it looks like you're in a dump. 
Like it looks like a war took place, and you know, this is like the remnants of that war. And then everyone is like carrying guns with them, and you know, they're locking their doors, they have like fences on their doors, security alarms and everything. Then you cross the border, and literally, you're just crossing a bridge. You come to the city of Windsor, and Michael Moore shows how he starts going door to door, and he just starts opening the door. Meaning that at nighttime, people don't even bother locking their doors. Because that's how accustomed to safety they have become. And this is again a big blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the first thing to mention, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He creates these blessings, that these are the two biggest blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants a civilization. Number two, is that these two particular descriptions are the descriptions of a true Lord. Then you know when we talk about Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, that if anyone wants to try to claim Rububiyyah, he wants to try to claim to be a Lord, then let him try to do these two things. Grant food to the people and grant them safety. That as an individual, no one will ever be able to claim this. Because safety is not something that is just purely physical, but rather it is something emotional and spiritual. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows people to be serene and tranquil, this is a sign of the trueness, or the true oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His actions. Because when you're in the control of a human being that claims to be a Lord, how safe will you actually feel? That if this person gets sick, if this person is killed, who will take care of you then? But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never dies. And this is, you know, uh, something that the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminded of, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ الَّذِي الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتْ That put your trust in the ever-living that never dies. That Allah doesn't get sick, He doesn't disappear, He doesn't die, Allah will always be there to protect and to take care of His servants and slaves. So this is the true aspects of Rububiyyah. The actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of his slaves. And that if a person truly wants to claim lordship, then let him try to do these two things. The third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing in this over here, is again, the breakdown of the body and the soul. That both of these things need nourishment. So the body needs food, and the soul needs safety. Now, this concept of food and safety is not just in this dunya alone, but it is something in the akhirah as well. So you'll notice that one of the major incentives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions time and time in the Quran again about Jannah is the types of food that they will eat. The types of food that you will eat. Meaning that in Jannah, in the hereafter, you will need food as well, right? And that is why one of the ways that the people of paradise are given their blessings is the food that they're given. And one of the ways the people of the hellfire are punished is the food that they're given. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about how this is going to be continuous, not only in this life, but in the hereafter. And then same thing with the element of safety. That safety is not only for this life, but the ultimate safety is in the hereafter, when people will have nothing to grieve and nothing to fear. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time and time again tells us, وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ That there will be no fear for them that day, on that day, and they will have nothing to grieve about. So again, this is for the hereafter as well. Same thing with the people of the hellfire, that they'll be in a constant state of fear, they'll be in a constant state of panic, always distressed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that just like you cherish these things in this dunya, long for these things in the hereafter as well. So how do you attain them in the akhirah? By going one ayah back, فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ That let them worship the, the Lord of this house in oneness alone. Let them worship the Lord of this house in oneness alone. And that is how they will attain these blessings. Not only in this dunya, but in the akhirah as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We'll open up the floor for Q&A. I know today's halaqa was short, but it was a very short surah. And we'll continue next week, so we'll have five questions. Go ahead. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very interesting things here. I'm going to uh, add something like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, those people are shahada. Shuhada. Shuhada. Yeah. Even don't think about their diet. Yes. And they take care by Allah and Allah give them provision. That right. That means the food. Food and everything else that they need. They need. Food yes. They need. But uh, only these people are getting continuously, like those who are shwada. But normal people who are dying, they have in between another time is like bajak. Yes. So these people are not taking something in between. 
only here and here after the when they go for the when uh, when go up for the day of judgment. Yes. Then they need the food, right? Are you talking about the shohada? Yeah. I'm the shohada are always taken care of. They're always taken care of. That a person who dies shaheed, he will be taken care of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the second, you know, the blood falls onto the floor, Allah has shown this slave of his where his place will be in paradise. So there will be like, the shuhada are the one, one of the few groups of people that Allah is taking care of. They, don't, they won't need to worry about anything inshallah. As long as they were sincere. was praying I have never come across a narration like that why would someone need to pray in the Akhirahi? And they will do tasbih, but in terms of actually performing salah, I have never heard of any narration like that. First of all, he said, he just made, made the people with the different uh, heaven. Yes. Uh, with, the, with the prophet. Yeah. But the below, another narration, they say, they meet with. Uh, Bring it next time and let me see it, inshallah. Bring it for me. Uh, my question is that, like, uh, this. Uh, two things, how you relate it, like uh, people are confused. Here. Sorry, which two things? Like, uh, the, as you mentioned, Akhira, we need the food, right? Yes. And in Dunya. Yes. But in between, not. But Allah SWT say, those are people that uh, show that they, they need to still they need. Because they go directly to the uh, heaven. Okay, so the first thing to understand is that the life of the Barsakh is that while the bodies will be there, it is still a spiritual life. It is not a physical life. That if you were to go and dig up graves, you will find dead bodies there, right? So in terms of what is happening over there, the human eye does not see it, nor does the mind understand it, because it is something beyond the realm of this world. So it is only the physical body that needs food. It is not the spiritual body that needs the food. So in terms of uh, you know, the two issues, the hereafter is where the physical, physical bodies will be there, and in this dunya the physical bodies will be there, and that is why they need the food. But in the barzakh, there's no concept of the physical body. Even though the physical bodies will feel pain, there's no concept of the physical body being alive, and that is why they won't need food. That is the way I understood your question. I hope that makes sense, inshallah. Now it's still like you see, the Allah emphasizes the grave. He, he, he provides the provision for them. Those are the... Father. Right. Well, he, I mean, he says, provisions over here is very general. And one of the aspects of risk is food. But is that specifically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to? Allah knows best. We'll find out when we go there, inshallah. <laughs> Question number two. Okay, go ahead. You mentioned the caravan, or the the Hajj? The was safe. Yeah, so rihla over here, it just comes from to travel. So anytime you travel, this is considered uh, a rihla. This is what the word rihla over here means. Now the, the majority of scholars, they said the rihla tishitai was safe. This is the caravan that used to travel to Yemen and to Asham. Uh, Yemen in the winter time and Asham in the summertime to do business. For business caravans? Yes, for business caravans. Question number three, anyone? Go ahead. Correct. Excellent. So this issue of 
Can there be new interpretations and meanings for the Qur'an that were not known during the times of the predecessors? The Mufassirun actually differed on this issue. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. What seems to be correct is that you are allowed new interpretations and new meanings of the Qur'an uh, as long as one thing is kept in mind, that it is not in direct opposition or in contradiction to the Qur'an itself, to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, or the interpretation of the companions. As long as this principle is kept in mind, then the person can come up with new and you know, different meanings for the Qur'an. As you mentioned that even personal events can be taken into light in terms of the Qur'an, even though they may have not you know, happened at that time as of yet. So as long as that principle is kept in mind, the new interpretations are allowed. Now keep in mind, this is not uh, an opinion that there is consensus on. Some of the scholars clearly said that we can only stick to what they call a tafsir bil ma'thur, that you have to have evidence for everything that you say. But if you look at one of the goals of the Quran, which is to build a relationship, and it is a, a lifelong message, that meaning it's not just restricted to the time of the messenger or the time of the sahaba, but it will continue until the day of judgment, it seems that you know, it fits the maqasid of the Quran. That one can come up with new meanings and they can have a personal relationship and journey with the Qur'an that another person might not have. But the key condition is that it should not oppose or contradict with those three things. The Qur'an itself, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, and the opinions of the companions radiallahu anhum. Allah knows best. Generally speaking, if you want to look more into this, study what they call Tafsir al-Ishari. Tafsir al-Ishari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Question number four. Anyone? Go ahead. I have a question actually that uh, uh, came to my mind a lot uh, in the past few years. If somebody from your family is, uh, God forbid, uh, uh, paralyzed or something like that, but is still alive, can you perform his salat al ibadah on his behalf? Since he is, if he is awake but cannot physically perform it, or if he's on a coma? Okay, excellent question. When it comes to Salah, this is an individual act. This is not something that can be done by another person. Whereas fasting, Hajj, these are things that can be done on behalf of an individual. But with Salah, that's not the case. And the reason why that is not the case is because we never found the Prophet ﷺ ordering any of the companions to do this uh, on behalf of other people. Nor did we see the companions themselves take this initiative to do it. So the Salah itself is a very individual act. So here you have one of two scenarios. Number one, this person is paralyzed and their body cannot move. So in such a situation, this person would even make salah with his eyes. So even if he's unable to make wudu, he would just make salah with his eyes. And if someone is able to wash him for salah, that's great. If not, Allah has uplifted this burden from him and he makes salah with his eyes, if that is the very least that he can do. In the state that where this person is in a coma and he is not conscious, then he has not been obligated with salah at that current time. And it is only when he gains consciousness that he will become commanded with salah. So the pen has been lifted from the one who is asleep. And this is a particular case that it would refer to. That when a person is not conscious, they are not obligated with salah. It is only when they gain consciousness that they will become obligated with salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wafiqa barakallah. Last question for the night. Go ahead. Same line, in line with the question my brother asked. When we say, Amatullah Malaika, they will put away. Yeah. Does the same rule apply in that case also that we follow the teachings from Bible and Gospel and Old Testament and all that as long as it aligns with Quran? Excellent. So in terms of our belief of the previous testaments, it comes down into one of three scenarios. Scenario number one, the Quran is in agreement with the previous, test, with the previous uh, revelations and we have no problem accepting this. Number two, the Qur'an is in opposition to those uh, previous revelations, so we prefer the Qur'an over those previous revelations. Or number three, the Qur'an did not come to speak about those previous revelations, and the correct opinion in such a matter is that we make what they call tawakkuf, meaning that we do not prefer it, nor do we reject it. We just leave it as it is. So we narrate it as it came, and we don't say it is authentic, nor do we say it is unauthentic. Make sense? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, two announcements, bidhinlahi ta'ala. Number one is that Friday night, bidhinlahi ta'ala, we're going to be starting up our halaqa on marriage, bidhinlahi ta'ala. So the brothers who are single or brothers looking to get married. Uh, that's what I said, brothers who are single or looking to get married. <laughs> I made that very clear. But you know, I won't do the nikah. You'll have to find someone else to do the nikah. <laughs> But if you're single looking to get married, this Friday bin Nai Ta'ala, we're starting up what are the ahkam of zawaj, you know, what are the things that you need in order for a nikah to be valid? What are the things that you should look for in a spouse? 
uh, what are the integrals of an Islamic contract? So does a woman need to have a wali when she gets married? Or is it something that is just recommended? Does the mahar need to be stated? What is the mahar? Do we need witnesses for the contract? All these things with the Naitala we will be discussing this Friday. That's going to be at Edmonton Trail at 7 p.m. with the Naitala. And we'll be discussing things related to marriage for the next four weeks. So all the way until January 4th with the Naitala, we will be discussing the topic of marriage. The second announcement want, I want to make by a show of hands, can you show me who has children here in Calgary? Who has children here in Calgary? Excellent, so quite a few of you. So on December 29th, we're having a program that I promised at one ummah. And that was a program called Date Your Spouse. Now the, the, the point behind this program is that one of the things you'll notice that you're working, your wife stays at home, she's always with the children, she complains that you don't love me anymore, you never show me you know, the, your romantic side anymore, once you started having children. So we wanted to redevelop this concept in our community where you know, a husband and wife, they should be able to be what we call romantic with one another. So what we want to do is, on December 29th, you drop off your children at Edmonton Trail, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And bithin Allah ta'ala, they will be in a halal Muslim environment. And we're going to be having halal games and halal entertainment and all sorts of fun stuff for the kids. And you can go and have a good time. Now the condition over here is that we will make you sign a contract that it's not just about you parents being free from the kids and you just sit at home and do nothing. But the contract is going to be that you have to take your spouse out for dinner. So either the brother is taking his wife out to a restaurant or the sister is preparing a very special meal for her husband at home and they're having their alone time. So that is what this event is about bithin Allah ta'ala. We're recording the, the promo video for it tonight so you'll be getting an email about it sometime this week. Emphasis on this that if you have not signed up for the emailing list, please do so because all the registration and all the promotional uh, material will be available only through the emailing list. So please sign up for the emailing list so you'll get the promo, you'll get the registration form and with the night I hope you drop off your kids. We are going to be having a, a limit on the number of kids we accept. It'll either be 25 or 30 kids because obviously we can't accommodate everyone's kids. So I would suggest that if you are interested in this, start doing two things. Number one, start making those reservations. December 29th is like peak season because everyone's on holiday. It may not be easy to get a, a table at a restaurant. So start making reservations. And number two, as soon as you get that registration form, register your kids right away because we don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu la ilaha illant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.